Do you know Photoshop? If so, you may know about the program soon to be enhanced gradients. If not, just grab the gradient tool and then drag to create what's known as a live gradient complete with on canvas controls. Isn't that exciting? Well, it gets better. This particular piece of artwork contains about two and a half million pixels, which is dinky. Want to make it 70 times that large or 181 million pixels in all in like a minute? then check out my Patreon. And by the way, for these next few minutes to go your way, you'll need to be working inside a little thing called Photoshop Beta, or just kick back and enjoy this as a preview of things to come. All right, let's start things off with that new feature, Live Gradients, which is currently found inside Photoshop Beta. I'm using version 24.1, but presumably this feature will be part of regular old Photoshop. And so for the sake of demonstration, I'm gonna take this file right here, which features a bunch of vector-based shape layers, and we're gonna add a ton of gradients in order to create this final dazzling effect. All right, so I'm calling my starter file Fanciful Skyline because after all, it's obviously New York. We've got the Statue of Liberty and not to scale, one World Trade Center. However, what's going on with these bridges right here? We've got the Brooklyn Bridge over on the left and the Manhattan Bridge on the right. That's what I'm imagining anyway. And so if you're familiar with New York, then you may know that there's this place called Jane's Carousel that's over in Brooklyn. And so I'm imagining that's where we are with the bridges coming toward us over the East River. Now they do happen to just end abruptly, a la Escape from New York, but we're still going to manage to get this really cool effect. All right, so let's create a starter gradient here. Notice that my flat background is selected here inside the layers panel. And so what I'm going to do is switch to the gradient tool, which you can get by pressing the G key. Now I want you to notice here inside Photoshop beta once again, over here on the far left side of the options bar, we have this little pop-up menu. If you set it to classic gradient, then you're a fool, I tell you, because that's gonna create a regular old static gradient. We don't want that. That would serve no purpose whatsoever. The newness is this right here, gradient, which will give us a, uh, a, 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 a dynamic gradient layer is what I was trying to say. All right, so I'm gonna just scroll down a little bit so I can see actually a lot bit here. So I can see the bottom of my canvas and then I'll go ahead and drag from let's say the center of Lady Liberty's head right here. And then I'm gonna drag down. Now notice that I can drag in any old direction. However, um, I wanna create a vertical gradient, so I'm gonna press and hold the shift key to constrain the angle. Now, I want you to ignore my cursor for a second. I'm just gonna keep it down. And notice over on the far right side of the window there, screen, we're seeing the layers panel. Watch what happens. As soon as I release, I'm just dragging to slightly below the edge of the canvas. As soon as I release, we get a dynamic gradient layer right here. Now, I don't need this layer mask. It's just getting in my way. So I'm gonna select it by clicking on it. It's that white thumbnail right there. And I'll press the backspace key in order to get rid of it. Delete key on the Mac, and I'll rename this layer East River because that's what it represents. Might as well go ahead and type the rest of the letters right there. All right, so it's currently a black to white gradient, which is not what we want. And I don't really want it centered in Lady Liberty's head. I want to move it not like that. Notice if I drag inside the, the top circle right there, I go ahead and change the angle of the gradient. That's not what I want. So I want to move the gradient by dragging this vertical bar. It's vertical because the gradient is vertical, don't you know? And I'll move it so the top is right there, kind of in the center of One World Trade Center. And then I want to change that color, so I'm going to double click on it in order to bring up the color picker dialog box. Now, I like to work with HSB. Just really easy to dial in those values. So I'll just change this uh, hue value to 210 degrees, which is blue. I'll tab to the saturation value, take it up ever so slightly to 33% and make the color much brighter by taking the brightness up to 100% like so. And we get this kind of baby blue. It's gonna work out nicely. Now, what I'd like to do is just move this color down a little bit reposition that color stop. But again, if I drag the color stop, it's going to change the angle of the gradient. That's what happens anytime you drag either that first color stop or the last one that will also change the angle like so. All right, I'll undo that change. Here's what I'm gonna have to do instead. Even though I just wanna duplicate the color, I'm just gonna click at this location. Actually notice nothing happened. Look at the cursor. Now I'm not, I'm not swearing to you that this is the way things will continue to work because I don't actually think this tool is behaving like it's totally baked, but I'll just move my cursor over a little and notice that I get an error head with a little plus sign. And so what I'm gonna do is click at that point and that'll create another color stop. 
And now I'll double click on that guy to once again bring up the color picker dialog box. And I'm going to look at my eyedropper right there. I can dial in the color manually again if I wanted to. But look at my eyedropper. I'm just going to click and the first color stop. That doesn't do anything. Anyway, that would be cool if it did. That's an aspirational feature on my part. I'm just going to dial in those values once again. 210 for H. 33 for S and 100 for B, and then I'll click OK in order to create that new color stop. And now this guy, I can drag it up and down like so, because it's not the first color stop or the last one, so it won't change the angle of the gradient. We also have these midpoints right here if you want to change the midpoint skew. I don't, so I'm just going to leave that alone. It's not going to do anything between two identical shades of blue. Anyway, all right. Now, I want to go ahead and click at this point. So move your cursor out so you can see a little plus sign click in order to create a new color stop and double click on it in order to bring up the color picker dialog box and uh, the, the hue value is zero by default in my case that's red even though it's black right now let's take the saturation value up to 50 percent not 500 because it doesn't go that high and then i'll change the brightness value to 100 percent like so and we have this kind of muted rose color let's say i'll click ok now i want you to notice that if you think you can duplicate one of these color stops by pressing the alt key or the option key on the mac and dragging it that ain't gonna work because it deletes that color stop. I don't see any purpose in that feature, by the way, pressing the Alt key or Option on the Mac to delete the color stop because you can just drag it out to the side too to get rid of it or drag it off of that gradient bar, the gradient annotator that is. But that's the way it works for now. All right, now let's say you want to dial a color in in advance. Notice the foreground color down here at the bottom of the toolbox. By default, it's set to black. I'm going to click on it to bring up the color picker dialog box. I just wanted to show you this little trick. I'm going to leave the hue set to zero degrees. I'm going to take the saturation up to 100%, which is as high as it goes. And then I'll take the brightness value up to 50%. So it's a dark, vivid red. Click OK. Notice that doesn't change the gradient at all. It doesn't do anything, but it does change the foreground color. See that? And now what I can do is click to create a new color stop and it will appear in that color. Is that not cool? Oops, I got one more color to change and that's the final color stop. You can drag it if you want to, but that's gonna change the angle of the gradient and so forth, or the length of the gradient like so, if I press the shift key while I drag it. Anyway, I'm gonna change the color by double clicking and I'm going to change the hue value once again to 200. Once again, this is a new value. It's, it's a shade of blue, of course. And then I'm gonna take the saturation up to 100%, the maximum, and I'm gonna take the brightness value up slightly to 20%. So we have a very dark, vivid blue, at which point I'll click okay in order to accept that change. Now, one of the downsides of this tool, the way it works right now, I hope Adobe improves it, is that you can't like set locations. I mean, I can't figure out how to do it, you know, using this annotator right here. And so, you know what I mean? Like this guy needs to be at zero point and uh, percent that is, and this guy needs to be at 20% in. So I might move it up a little bit like so, but I don't really have numerical precision over what's going on. If you want that, then go over here to the layers panel where you'll see your dynamic gradient layer and double click on it to bring up the gradient fill dialog box. And then you, because we want to edit the gradient itself, notice the scale, the scale right here is set to 40%. That's the length of my gradient. That is that gradient annotator that we saw a moment ago, how big it is compared to the height in our case of the canvas. All right, that's what I want. If you, if you, and the angle's negative 90 degrees. I'm, I'm imagining you're working along with me, but you're not. But still, I just this is what I'm looking for. Now I'll click on the gradient bar right there in order to bring up the gradient editor dialog box. And I'm going to set the locations of each one of these color stops. So I'll click on the first one, location is zero. That's what I want. Click on the second one, location is 21. That's not what I want. I want it to be 20. I just do, that's why. And then I'll click on this guy and location is 44. I want to take it down to 40 percent and then i'll click on this guy right here look it's it's up at 81 i don't want it to be that high you can just drag this guy like so until in my case i want the location value to be 60 and then the final color stop is at 100 that's what i want so i just want that kind of numerical control you don't get it any other way as things stand now just imagine i'm saying as things stand now constantly all right now I'll click ok and then i'll click ok again in order to update that gradient like so all right a couple other changes i want to make notice this skyline group right here that contains all these buildings the black ones up front and then the gray ones as well i want to blend them with a the gradient by changing the blend mode from pass through which means there is really no blend mode assigned to the group I want to override and apply multiply. So notice that the buildings, the gray buildings go from being gray 
Who wants that to be multiplied in so they're darker shades of that blue that's part of the gradient? All right, so I'll go ahead and choose that. Now, I want to create another gradient in the sky, specifically in the sky. So I'm going to go ahead and actually press Control-0, Command-0 on the Mac to center my zoom. And what I want to do is I, I'm going to add another gradient. But see, if you click on the East River gradient right there and you're armed with the gradient tool, then... Illustrator Photoshop is actually the program that I'm working in is just going to go ahead and edit the existing gradient like so. I don't want that. I want to create a new gradient, in which case just click on something else like the skyline layer that doesn't contain a gradient. Notice that. And now if I start, I'm going to zoom out a little bit here. If I drag from the center a uh, World Trade Center right there, one World Trade Center, and I drag over while pressing the shift key because this time I want a horizontal uh, gradient like so, then I end up creating a new gradient layer that we're seeing right here. All right, now I want to put it below the skyline layer, between the skyline layer and the East River layer. Doesn't look like it's making any contribution right now, and that's because, after all, it's just the same gradient as we applied before. So we need to make some changes. I'm going to select that layer mask right there. Just click on that white thumbnail and get rid of it by pressing the backspace key. Delete key on the Mac. And I'll rename this guy Sky because after all, trying to find my keyboard through the through the microphone here. Sky, it, this is what it's going to be. You'll see in just a moment. Just trust me for now. All right, let's make some changes to this gradient. Why don't we? And so I'll change the first color by double clicking on it to uh, let's change the hue to zero this time around. So red and 50 and then 100. That's great. Click OK. So we have that kind of rose color. And then I'm going to get rid of one of these color stops. I only want one color stop. And so I was telling you, as things stand now, you can alt or option click on it. Just that minus sign and then click and it goes away. Or better yet, I think, because who's going to... It, 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 just alt and option is supposed to duplicate a color stop. It's not supposed to get rid of it. So just drag it down. I'm just anticipating that Adobe will figure it out and change that behavior. All right, I'm going to drag the second color stop like so. And I'll go ahead and double click on it and change the hue to 240. And then we got 50-50 for the next few values like so. Dark blue, click OK. All right, so I, you know, just came up with these awesome colors, by the way, because they're so very awesome. So just, you know, 210, 100%, and then what? 40% I came up with for the brightness value. Click OK, and then I'll double click on this last guy, and I'll take the hue value up to 240, let's say, this time around, and I'll set the bright uh, the saturation to 100, and I'll take the brightness to 33, just because it's easy to type two threes in a row, and I'll click OK. Now, Notice this is a linear gradient, which means, by the way, you know this, that it goes from point X to point B in a line, in a straight line, horizontal in my case. I want to change it to a different kind of gradient, and you can do that up here in the options bar. I could go with a radial gradient, which could be cool, but for purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to change it to diamond, which gives us this gradient right here in the middle in a diamond shape. A little bit of rose color, that is. And then it goes out to the edge. Now, I want the gradient to take up the entire canvas. So I'm going to drag it out so that we have this big circle that's taking in the, the entire canvas like so. And I might drag the bar over a little bit, the, the annotator, that is to say. Now, I want to add some transparency. I, I can't do that with, with the gradient tool. Don't know why. Should be able to. Hopefully, one day you can. And... If you can, and I just don't know about it, shame on me. But here's what you can do. Double click on the dynamic gradient thumbnail right there to bring up the gradient fill dialog box. Click on this guy once again. Actually, angle. <gasps> angle is set to 0 0.13. That's so good, I want zero. Just plain zero degrees. I do want a scale value of 64%. My goodness, I'm doing a good job. And now I'm going to click on this gradient bar in order to bring up the gradient editor dialog box. Click on this first Color stop right here. The location value is zero. That's what I want. Click on the second one. The location value needs to be 30, like so. And then I'll click on the third one right there and take its location value up to 80. Confirm that the last color stop is set to 100. All right. Now, these guys above the gradient ramp right here are opacity stops. I'm going to drag the first one, which is set to 100%, so it's totally opaque to a location of 30%, like so. And I'll drag the second one over to a location of 90. So midway between those two color stops. And then I'll create a new uh, opacity stop, is what them are called. And I'll click right there. And I'll change its opacity to 0%, so it adds some transparency, like so. And then I'll drag its position to a location that value that is of 60, like so, 60%. And I will go ahead and click OK in order to accept that change. Go ahead and do it a couple of times, why don't you?
Now what I need to do is add a little bit of a layer mask. So I want to mask this gradient right here so it appears exclusively inside the sky. And I could do that just by kind of, yeah, actually, you know what, I will. I'll just grab my marquee tool. That's the easiest thing to do. You can get it by pressing the M key. I'll just drag it, draw a big old gradient that goes almost all the way to the bottom, but not beyond, not like that, because that would be sloppy. Just a little above that kind of black ground level right there. This, this should work out pretty nicely. And then I'll drop down to the add layer mask icon at the bottom of the layers panel and click on it. And notice that moves the diamond to the middle of things right there, to the middle of that layer mask. That's not what I want. So notice if I switch back to the gradient tool, I just want you to see this. Switch back to the gradient tool. There is no annotator. What happened to it? This is still a dynamic gradient layer where you got to click on the thumbnail right there, the colorful thumbnail. And now drag this guy down, drag the entire annotator down to the bottom right there. So that begins at the base of One World Trade Center. And we end up with this effect here. And now assuming you don't wanna see that gradient annotator anymore, just press the M key to switch back to the rectangular marquee tool. And I'll go ahead and zoom on in as well. And that my friends, my very dear friends, is how you work with the new live gradient feature, live gradients, that is plural, in the current version of Photoshop beta. Now let's talk about gradient methods, which are new, by the way, but you don't have to be running Photoshop beta. Now, methods refers to interpolation methods, so the ways in which the various colors inside of a gradient are calculated. We now have three different methods, by the way, starting with this guy right here, Classic, which is the only way we used to have, so it's the legacy uh, the, the interpolation method. And notice that we have a gradient right here, which is a classic gradient that goes from bright red to bright green and passes through a few colors in between. Now, classic means cubic interpolation. And in case you're wondering what in the world that is, basically the idea is it's a method for ensuring that we have smooth colors in between the two extremes without a bunch of banding. So the, the, the gradient ramps very slowly at the extremes, so we have a lot of reds and a lot of greens, and more quickly in the middle, so we have fewer colors in this middle region right here. Compared to Gaussian distribution, if you know anything about Ga Gaussian contours or Gaussian blur, that kind of thing. All right, but we now have two more methods, including, by the way, perceptual. This is a perceptual gradient, once again, going from red to green. So the, the extreme colors are identical. However, the colors in between are different. So perceptual calculates color transitions in, oh my God, if you thought we'd get a little technical here, the OK lab space. So the lab space is that device independent color space at work inside Photoshop. OK is just a variation on, on it. Instead of CIE lab, it's OK lab whatever that means. Anyway, doesn't matter. It, the, the idea behind perceptual is that it mimics natural gradients, gradients in the great outdoors as perceived by the human eye. So theoretically, the, the kinds of gradients you find inside photo, uh, photographs as well and Photoshop, of course. And next, the final method that we have is linear again from red to green, different colors in between. Each incremental color step is afforded equal weight. So very, very democratic system, much as in an inner or outer glow by default when you just leave the contour set to uh, linear, by the way. So anyway, I don't want to you know milk this too hard, but I do want to show you what's going on here. I'm going to switch to the eyedropper tool. I just have to mention this. Notice right below the eyedropper is the UFO tool in this particular version of Photoshop beta. I don't even know if it's on the Mac or, or nothing. You can check that out if you want to. We're not going to have anything to do with it. But notice, if I click over here, I want you to see that the color panel is up on screen and that it is set to color wheel. The great color wheel right here. So hue, saturation, and brightness as well as color wheel. So I'll click at the beginning and assuming sample is set to all layers, we'll see that this is red. Very, very bright red. So saturation and brightness both set to roughly 100%. And then if I click over here on the right-hand side, we've got green, 120 and, and 100, 100, more or less. So in other words, here's green on the big color wheel and here's red. So what's going to appear in between? Well, let's see. I'll click right there at the center. These little tick marks in there indicate the center of the gradient. I'll go ahead and click. And notice, oh, this is perfect. A hue value of 60 degrees. That is exactly yellow, by the way. 
a saturation value of 100%. That's a beautiful yellow. And a brightness value of 50%. That is a putrescence yellow. That's terrible. So as a result, we get these gloomy colors in the middle of a classic slash legacy gradient. Whereas Perceptual, the new hero and the new default, by the way, if I click in the center here, I want you to see that we get a slightly warmer hue. So it's a little bit oranger. It's not that different, but a little bit. It's definitely, uh, well, just as saturated, a little less saturated, actually, but it's much brighter. So we have a happy yellow. And we have some happy colors in between. This, we got some oranges over here. We don't have any oranges in the classic grade. We got bleh, basically. So, you know, it's, you know, whatever, that color right there, it's kind of orangey. But we have some nice, bright, happy oranges over here, as well as some kind of chartreuse going on. And then linear gradient, every single color is weighted the same. So the middle is all I'm really interested in. I'll click on it. It is 60%, so, oh, well, 59, but, you know, take it up one in 60%. That's yellow, almost full saturation, and a little less bright than linear, but pretty good looking. All right, so let's see how this might, these very settings might affect our sky gradient. So I'll go ahead and switch over to our illustration in progress and I'll switch to the gradient tool right there, which you can get by pressing the G key. I already mentioned that. Now notice that the sky layer is selected. So this is a live editable gradient layer. Now you can double click on it in order to bring up the gradient fill dialog box and notice right here that the method, we've got method that's new is set to perceptual by default. And you can switch it to one of the others that we just discussed a moment ago. However, I'm gonna cancel out here because I want you to notice that because the gradient is selected and we're working with a live gradient later, that we have method, a method option up here in the options bar. Now, if you, if you don't want banding with your gradients, then you want dither, leave dither turned on. That way you have a little bit of noise in the gradient, works great, but method, Check it out. This is perceptual. So oh, what, what's bothering me about this? Is it just like too continuous? We go from dark blue to light blue to transparency. There is some transparency there in the background. I want to emphasize this. I'm going to turn this layer off. So you can see that the transparency is giving us access to the original blues in the East River layer. So I'll turn it back on. There are those blues because we have a hole in the gradient, in our diamond gradient right there. But perceptual is giving us kind of this little bit of a glow down here in the middle, but then we have a propensity of dark blues. I could switch back to good old classic, in which case my propensity of dark blues becomes a bigger propensity. We do have more of the beginning color, however, right there. So that's nice, more of a red glow down here at the base of One World Trade. And But what I want is this kind of uh, lights in the sky look. Spotlight, I believe it's called. And so I'll switch to linear and notice that those light blues become more concentrated. We have more rosiness down here at the base and then we have more concentration of the, the transparent area, which is revealing those pale blues. And then we have some reds going on down here at the bottom of the Manhattan Bridge as well as the Brooklyn Bridge. Isn't that groovy? All right, now I want to basically infuse the East River down below with more red. Don't know why, just thought it looks cool. So I'm gonna, with this layer selected, the sky layer, I'm gonna go ahead and press that good old keyboard shortcut that you may know, it's actually Control J or Command J on the Mac for jump, J for jump. And if you wanna rename the layer as you create it, I believe I can do this, I'm gonna try it, Control Alt J, Command Option J on the Mac. Yes, that's successful. So I added the Alt or Option key. And that way I can call this guy, well, this is going to seem like a weird name, but I'm going to call it Bioloom for bioluminescence. So it's short for it. I just, I've got this layer mask going on. I don't want to truncate the layer name. So I'll click OK. All right. So there it is. It's on top. It should be below sky. So I'm just going to move it down. And then I want to take that layer mask, which is revealing the sky currently. And I want to reveal the river instead. So I'm just going to invert it. And the easiest way to do that. Well, here's the hard way. Oh, it's so tedious. Go to the image menu, choose adjustments, and then choose this guy, invert. What's the easy way? The easy way is to just press control I or command I in a Mac. Very old school keyboard shortcut. I think it comes from McPaint or something. Anyway, notice that we now reveal the colors in the river down below. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. Make sure, actually, notice the gradient tool is still selected, but we're not seeing the gradient annotator. Why would that be? Because the layer itself is not selected. So you got to click on the dynamic layer, uh, dynamic gradient thumbnail right there. And then I'm going to zoom out a little bit so I can see that center. I want to just move the entire gradient. So I'll drag the annotator up 
I would like if you could press the shift key while you do this and constrain the angle of that drag, but that, that doesn't work right now. Maybe one day it will. Anyway, I'll just move it so it's a little up like so. So that the diamond right there starts in the center instead of down here at the bottom. All right. That makes sense, right? Yeah, it does, Deke. All right. Now, what we want to do is I'm going to press the what? Uh, the, the, the the M key, actually, just to switch back to the rectangular marquee tool, because that way I get rid of the gradient annotator on screen. And I'm going to change the blend mode. Currently, it's normal, so we have no interaction between this layer and the East, Liver, East River layer behind it. But notice as I move down the stack of blend modes, I can see each one applied on the fly. Oh, that's beautiful. Good old darker color. Never useful. Anyway, I'm going to move down here. There's overlay. There's a hard light. Here's soft light. I love soft light. That's what we're going to apply, by the way, in order to achieve this effect. And so that, my friends, is how you take advantage of the various gradient methods, the new methods inside Photoshop. I want to show you one more thing. I want to show you how these methods apply to a radial grayscale gradient. I just, there's so much, I have so much to share with you. So this is a black, a white to black radial gradient set to classic. So in case you're creating like radial gradient masks, for example, and then perceptual right here, notice that we have more blacks. We have focused whites, focused highlights. So the black to white, I just wanted to show you this because you get kind of different results than when working with colors. And then linear, it's flat. It's got a flat, it's still radial, but you can't really see the radialness that much, but it is the flat distribution of the various gray values. And that is how you work with the various gradient methods here inside the newest version of Photoshop. Now let's take a brief look at working with gradient masks inside Photoshop, which has not changed. So unlike those dynamic gradient layers, which you can now modify using the gradient tool inside Photoshop beta, Grady masks are always static, just as they have always been. And so what we're going to do is add this reflection down here inside the East River. And notice how it just drops away thanks to this gradient mask right here. Do you see it? All right, so let's create it. I'm going to go ahead and grab the skyline layer right there, and I'm going to make a copy of it. I'm going to jump it by pressing Control J or Command J on the Mac. This time, I'm not pressing Control alt j or Command-Option-J because that trick doesn't work with groups. All right, now I'll rename the bottom one. I'll go ahead and call it, let's say, Reflection because that's what it's going to be. And now what I want to do is flip it so that it's going downwards instead of upward. And so what you want to do is go to the Edit menu and choose Free Transform or just press, press Control-T or Command-T on the Mac. I love this feature. And now notice that I'm seeing this uh, center point right here for my transformation. And that's a function of turning on this checkbox over here on the far left side of the control panel. Notice that it is not even available, it's dimmed. However, you can turn it on and that makes this thing come up on screen, this little focus point. I'll go ahead and drag it, hello, come with me. Drag it down here to the bottom until it snaps into place like so. And then I'll drag the top right here. Make sure the W and H values are not linked together. So make sure the chain is off and then go ahead and drag this guy down. It's just a precaution. I don't know if that is really necessary or not, but now notice that I've dragged it down. So it's flipping, don't you know, but, and it's flipping around the, the base of the buildings, which is great. So that's the purpose of that focus point right there. And notice that the width value is still hundred percent. That's what I want. I'm going to change the height value to negative 90 is what I'm looking for. Then I'll press the enter key or the return key on the Mac a couple of times to accept that change. All right. Now we need to add a layer mask so that this guy uh, just kind of fades away from view, out of view. And so I'll go ahead and click on the add layer mask icon down here at the bottom of the layers panel. How exciting is that? And then I'll just go ahead and select the gradient tool, which you can get by pressing the G key for the umpteenth time. Now, I, I want you to notice something. I'll just go ahead and drag this guy up a little bit so I can see the bottom of the canvas. I want to create a kind of gradient from the base upward like so, and I'll press the shift key as I do. But notice I'm, I am kind of seeing a gradient annotator at this point, but when I release, it goes away. Also, what in the world bizarre thing have I done? Well, I want you to see up here in the control panel, the options bar that is, that classic gradient is dimmed. It's not an option, by the way, it's just dimmed, meaning you can't apply it because this is a static 
uh, layer mask. This isn't that beautiful? Look at that. All right, that's just a function of me alter option clicking on it. All right, I'll come back. Come back to reality. And notice it's a diamond. I don't want a diamond. That's that's a problem. And it, I don't want all these colors inside of a layer mask because layer masks have to be grayscale by definition. White makes the layer visible. Black makes it invisible and so forth. All right. So what do you do? Well, we'll, we'll just, un well, no, yeah, yeah, we'll undo that change. All right, that's a better way to work. And then I'll right click on this little gradient icon on the far left side of the options bar and I'll choose reset tool. And notice this little gradient right here, how colorful it is. As soon as I choose reset tool, also notice that diamond is selected. As soon as I reset tool, then we get a black to white gradient and it's linear which is exactly what we want. All right, now you want to drag, or I want to drag, from uh, underneath the canvas, the bottom of the canvas, just outside of it a little bit, and I'll drag up to the pedestal for the One World Trade Center building, and I'll go ahead and uh, release at this point right here so that we're fading the buildings into view as we're seeing here. And so that's how you continue to work with a gradient layer mask here inside any old version of Photoshop that you like. Thank you so much for watching. Feel free to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Do you like live gradients? Do you wish there was more? Wouldn't it be nice to like duplicate a color stop or add transparency or dial in a few numbers? Comment down below. And by the way, we're not done. This is where we are so far. This is where we're going. Want it? Go to patreon.com slash deke now. And then go to deke.com and subscribe to my newsletter. I'm Deke McClellan. This is Photoshop Now.